Hey, welcome to the ground instruction for commercial level instrument flying on a partial panel. And this lesson is going to cover timed turns. So just for reference, when you are doing your private pilot, you are using your full panel and full panel refers to uh, flying with reference to the instruments only. So hopefully you are flying an aircraft that has a six pack, not all do, but um, that way it just makes it easier for your scan. And I'm not going to review the scan here, but the scan just refers to how you are uh, supposed to learn how to fly it on the instruments, not to fixate on one instrument, but to constantly scan between the instruments to make sure that you're flying straight and level or however you want to fly. Um, your primary uh, instrument is your attitude indicator because it gives you the most up-to-date information. It's almost uh, instantaneous, whereas the other instruments will have a lag. I'm not going to go into this right now, but uh, just I wanted to cover what the full panel means. Now, a partial panel is when you are flying with reference to the instruments, but uh, want, want, now your vacuum system has failed and you no longer have your attitude indicator, which used to be your primary, nor do you have your heading indicator. And that can cause a bit of a mix up. Um, this has caused fatal accidents in aviation in the past with people who were not proficient in partial panel flying under instruments in hard IFR. And that's why we cover it in the commercial level. So if you are flying partial panel, what happens is your primary, the attitude indicator is no longer available for you and your scan must change and you're going to use the turn coordinator now as your primary. So again, uh, this is kind of what it looks like when you do your, your partial panel uh, scan. Your turn coordinator becomes your primary instrument. Why is that? Because with the gyro, it's electrically powered. So um, they run on the attitude indicator and the turn coordinator run on completely separate uh, gyro systems. One is the vacuum system, either provided externally on the plane or by the engine, and the turn coordinator is electronic. That's why you hear it start up when you turn on the master. So your turn coordinator is your primary instrument if you are flying under a partial panel. When you are flying with the turn coordinator as your primary, unfortunately, it does not give you pitch information the way that the attitude indicator does. So that's why typically, because the airspeed indicator is right above, it can be a good proxy. If your power set uh, to whatever setting that you want, that you choose, and you do not change it, then hypothetically, your airspeed would only increase if you were pitched down and decrease if you were pitched up. So you can use that as kind of a proxy to make sure that you're not climbing or descending while flying under a partial panel. And then of course, because your turn coordinator indicates rate of turn, you just wanna keep the wings level if you wanna fly a straight and level. Then following the instrument procedures, which is uh, what information do I need? Where do I find this information? And this, is this information reliable? That's when you start to reference your altitude indicator and your vertical speed indicator um, to confirm that the ASI is actually giving you good information. Furthermore, you do want to glance periodically at your RPM to make sure that your power is not fluctuating. You'll probably hear it, but it's a good reference. And um, also to your magnetic compass to make sure that you're holding straight and level flight in the direction that you wish to continue in. So you're not going to be required to show this on a private pilot check ride, but you are going to be required to show this kind of proficiency in your commercial level check ride. And this is why we teach this uh, timed turns and partial panel at the commercial level, because you're going to have to show it on your flight test. So under exercise 24 instrument flying, um, we're going to do another video on radio navigation aids. So ignore that for now. We'll just talk about the limited panel. So basically the examiner wants to know that you can control the aircraft without reference to the attitude indicator and the heading indicator. So under a partial panel situation and uh, with standby instruments and magnetic compass only as your reference. And um, what they're going to ask you to do is hold straight and level and a turn. The turn will not be less than 90 degrees or more than 180 degrees. So you can kind of plan for that. It's a good way to cheat because you're like, oh, it's going to be within that range. And it's going to be under a partial panel situation. So uh, you will be expected to maintain straight and level flight when and when, when requested by the examiner, execute a timed turn. And I'll tell you why it's timed in a second, um, 
you can probably guess why by now, but uh, yeah, the that will be measured in accordance with the form the following performance criteria. So plus or minus 15 degrees of of heading on your rollout and within 100 feet of altitude and within plus or minus 10 knots of airspeed. So make sure that you're when you are practicing these that you perf that your performance is within this standard because that is the flight test standard. Okay, so now we know we're flying under a partial panel situation. Let's talk about why we time these turns. A rate one turn is where you do a complete 360 degree turn in two minutes. So the cool thing about a rate one turn, it, is, it doesn't matter what speed you are going, that turn will be executed in the same amount of time because different air speeds will give you a different radius. So if you are going more slowly, your angle of bank is gonna be less than if you are going faster. And so the rate one turn, the reason that the turn coordinator gives you that rate one turn indication and not angle of bank indication is because this is how you wanna be making your turns in a time to turn situation and in IFR. So before we go any further, let's quickly review compass errors and what causes them. So as we know, the compass is north seeking. And here in Canada, that creates a problem because what it does is it creates a dipping tendency that is offset from the pivot point of the compass. And the compass is designed that way in order for it to sit more level in the cup and be more readable. Um, but what that means in English is that here in Canada, you're going to have issues when reading your compass. It's going to give you erroneous readings in the following conditions. When you're accelerating, decelerating, and when you're turning, the compass is not reliable. So I'm not going to go into any more detail about why the compass does not read properly in these conditions, but what you need to remember is if you are accelerating or decelerating or turning, you cannot trust your compass. And the problem with that is that when you are in a partial panel situation, you no longer have a heading indicator. So if you execute a turn and you can't trust your compass, how do you know that you're going to roll out on a specified heading? This is the problem. And this is why we study timed turns is because when you time the turn, that's how you are going to roll out on your predicted and desired heading when you do not have reference to any kind of instrument because your compass is unreliable. Another thing that I really want to point out, which often tricks people up, is remember that the compass is painted backwards. Okay, so you've got the north side of the compass facing north, and what you read is the back side of the compass. Therefore, it almost looks if as though the compass is um, printed with the numbers in the wrong direction. If you look at the heading indicator, for example, and the compass uh, indication in this photo, you'll notice that if you want to increase, it kind of looks, if you're looking at the compass, like you want to turn to the left, but that's wrong. You actually want to execute that turn to the right. And I usually say, think left for less and right for increasing when you talk about the compass, because that really helps to, um, for the student to remember that you can't trust the numbers on the compass. They will tell you to turn in the opposite direction. So let's take a minute just to review the way that the rate one turn works. It's a 360 degree turn, which is executed in two minutes, meaning that it's a 180 degree turn in 60 seconds and a 90 degree turn in half of that or 30 seconds. So as long as you are executing a rate one turn, you are turning 10 degrees every three seconds. And this allows you to calculate how long you would like to stay in the turn in order to roll out on a specified heading. And in the flight test, you're going to have to demonstrate this uh, proficiency. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to practice this with an instructor. And remember that the turn that the examiner is going to ask you to do is going to be greater than 90 degrees or 30 seconds, but not greater than 180 degrees or 60 seconds. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to practice turns within that range to gain proficiency. Also, um, you might want to review with your instructor turns to the left, which can be more challenging. So as an easy example, if I was in an aircraft with an instructor on a heading of north, 
and they said, they were playing the examiner, and they said, I want you to turn to a heading of 135, then I would know that that turn would take me 45 seconds. So I would execute a rate one turn for 45 seconds, roll out, wait for the compass to settle, and then verify against my compass if I had executed that turn correctly. Just a quick review of what your instruments are going to look like in this turn, but remember, boom, boom, you don't have your attitude indicator or your heading indicator, um, but your airspeed will be constant. The turn indicator will show a constant rate of turn, and um, that means that the ball will be in the center if you're coordinated and the wing will be on the lower line. The altimeter and the VSI will also be steady if you are not climbing and descending. So now that you understand the theory behind the time to turn, let's talk about the execution. And the one thing I want to stress is that um, you really want to spend a significant amount of time thinking about how you are going to enter and exit this maneuver before you even get in the plane. Because um, in the plane, you're really going to want to practice these because the execution is quite messy if you're not mentally prepared for it. So before you even think about starting this maneuver, what you want to do is ensure that your wings are straight and level so that your compass is reliable and read your current heading. Once you've done that, calculate how much time your turn is going to be and then roll into a rate one turn. Maintain that turn for the required time. And once the required time is up, roll out of the turn. Then you want to maintain straight and level while you wait for the compass to settle, because remember, as you roll out, the compass is still going to be not reading properly. Give it two or three seconds and then note the heading and, al and uh, altitude. So these are some common errors that I've observed when teaching this maneuver. One of them is reading the incorrect magnetic heading before starting the maneuver. Um, usually that's caused by rushing into the maneuver. So turning the aircraft and then being like, oh, what's my heading? Yeah, it's the, the aircraft's already banked. So your compass reading is going to be wrong. So don't feel like you're getting forced into the maneuver. Not cleanly rolling into the turn and not holding the turn. If you're, if you're, if the time it takes you to roll into that turn is more than one to two seconds, that is going to mess up your timing. And if you're overbanking or underbanking, that is also going to mess up your timing and will probably lead to you rolling out on a heading that is greater than 15 degrees outside of that acceptable range for your flight test. Um, Again, rolling out of the turn too early or too late, um, usually just caused by distraction, whether you're gaining or losing altitude, that can be enough of a distraction to cause you to roll out of the turn too late. Turning in the wrong direction is one of the biggest ones I've seen. And again, we covered this before. It's because the compass is trying to mislead you. Don't trust it. Turn the opposite way that you think that you are supposed to turn by looking at the compass. Remember, left for less. And the last one is wrong calcul calculation of the recorded time. And this, again, could be something that you can practice on the ground to make sure that you're really proficient so that once you do get in the airplane and have all these distractions, it doesn't throw you off and you can do your calculations correctly. So one thing I want to point out is that in the flight test guide, it does say that you're permitted one heading correction. However, this is for precision and not in case you turn in the wrong direction. So if you do end up turning in the completely wrong direction, you quite possibly could have failed that item. However, if you've overbanked, underbanked, or miscalculated your rollout, and you're outside of that 15 degree uh, limit for your flight test, you are permitted, just know that you can fix it. Um, you've got one shot to get it back within that 15 degree range in order to pass that item on your flight test.